Oh, it's not even on. Welcome to Build in Isolation. I am your host, Danny Clayton, and joining me today is an Australian actress and singer. One that has brilliant comic timing on screen and has sad, tragic piano behind uh, the, uh, the tools. But uh, it is my pleasure to chat with her all things music, all things ISO, all things acting. I would like to introduce Georgia Flood. How are you doing, my dear? I'm doing so well. How are you doing? Thank you for that intro. <laughs> I'm doing pretty well, you know. I've got a nice cup of tea uh, and enjoying life. Uh, I mean, you're an international woman. Uh, you get around the, the globe quite frequently. So firstly, where are you streaming from? I'm currently streaming from Melbourne. <laughs> it's not that exotic. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I had to come back here because of COVID. You know, I was living in LA and my agents rang and they were like, get on a plane right now. And I had to kind of upend my life there and come back. Because at the time, no one knew what was really going to happen. It was quite apocalyptic, really. Mm. It still is. <laughs> it does still seem quite apocalyptic. I mean, uh, in LA, you were really kicking goals and there were some really exciting things uh, starting to happen. We're going to get to that very, very shortly. But before we get to that, I wanted to talk to you about your music. Because a lot of musicians have been finding this time actually quite useful in coming up with new melodies, new lyrics, new songs. Have you been finding the same situation? I mean, 1000%. I've probably written enough for an album now. And usually people just, musicians just say that. And I have said that in the past, but because I've had so much time on my hands, I've actually finished the songs <laughs> that are just usually seeds. And um, I have set up a studio here. I've got my guitar. I've got, got all, I've, I don't want to, uh, well, I will. There's my microphone, but it's on this like makeshift, like wooden thing oh, <laughs> that wow. I made with like duct tape so I can like screw it around. And I've like decorated my guitar with diamantes and like rhinestones. And I've just made this little sort of dream lodge here. And yeah, I've created a lot. And we've still managed to produce, um, release Bird, my single. And even mm. though in the middle of it, when I was in LA with my producers and we had to do it back and forth on Zoom and I had to do the rest of the vocals on this shitty mic. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah. It's, still, it's still like exciting. Yeah, there is that lyric in your song Bird where it's like, if only you would let me fly. I kind of feel like that's a little bit about like COVID and not being able to go to LA. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I hadn't thought of that. It's so funny. You know, yeah. I was playing the piano the other night and dad came in and I started playing that song, Bird because it's you can just play it on the piano. And dad was like, what's that tune? I think I know that. <laughs> and then he sang along to the chorus and he got the words. He was like, if only you'd let me fly, I'd have been a bird. And he was like, I think that's better, a bird. Ah. I was like, thanks, dad. Well, and he was like, oh, I love Delta Goodrum. This is such yeah, a good song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. Um, I really like the artwork, actually, for that single, which uh, you see little handprints on the window of a plane. And I don't know why that really stuck. Oh, have you got it with you per chance? Stop, look, this is my, this is what it's from. I was literally just writing a post yesterday. I'm so glad you asked. Wow. Self-involved, but it's, <laughs> it, it's my um, handprints from 1997. So oh. I'm seven years old and there's a little poem that goes with it. And at the end, the poem says, Keep these prints of my two hands to help you recall exactly what they looked like that time when I was small. And I was like, I felt really small in those relationships that I'm talking about in Bird. And, and being COVID, we had to go through all these boxes. It was a great time to go through all of our shit. And I found all of my artwork as a kid. And I'm like, I'm fucking Picasso, man. Like there's like... <laughs> Like, wait, look at, look at that. I mean, that is just genius. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> uh, look at, isn't so that now, This that is where I'm going to get all my future album artwork. Wow. So we scanned, oh, dad scanned them in and then we, we fiddled around with like, I was just, I just had the hands. I was like, that's boring. And then I wanted to have a, I wanted to juxtapose it with a photo that like mm, represented freedom and travel is freedom to me and fly, it's flying, it's a plane, whatever. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's it. That's the album so, artwork. 
I'm glad I asked you that question. Uh, <laughs> I actually didn't think that I'd get such a thorough answer. Um, <laughs> so what is the plan with the music? Are we going to get more soon? Do you have release dates? Can you tell us something about it? Yeah, so I have a meeting tomorrow um, with, uh, with Zoom, with Ari and Arturo, my producers, and I just love working with them. We just vibe and they totally, it's one of those relationships where it's like, no, that idea is shit. Why would you think of that? Let's move on. And like, you know, one of those just like totally can be ourselves. And I actually, my next, we, I sent them a Dropbox of like nine songs that I've been working on and we've refined it with my singing coach, which song we all liked. And everyone hands down liked this one particular song. It's super personal to me and I'm really scared about it. But I think that the more, I think that it could be potentially very healing for a really broad range of people. So I was like, well, I have to do it. So mm. we're working on that next and um, it's called Witches. Cool. And um, it's, it's going We've to be- We've actually had Witches on this show uh, previously, actually. Uh, Jack River, um, she is uh -huh. a bona fide Australian witch. Uh, definitely check out her tunes as well. So I... maybe a collab. <laughs> I feel like I've been tapping, I've been leaning into my Wiccan abilities. <laughs> I just, I'm fascinated by it. And also like it's part, I've been doing some research with like Irish folklore and my own ancestral lineage and f trying to find like, I actually always have loved the Cranberries and U2 and Sinead O'Connor and Enya and they're all Irish and I have a, you know, that's my heritage. So I've oh. started to be like, cool, like what instruments were going on um, at that time when like witches were real and like drums and harps and like all like really amplified voice uh, echoey voices and so that's what the song is going to be very much like tribalistic. Wow yeah. well did like, did my, uh, my grandma is actually Irish as well so really uh, yeah look, look at us. Is she alive? <laughs> uh, she no quite, quite a long time ago. Okay but, yeah. yeah. She, uh, she That's good. I'm sorry I asked that question. <laughs> be terrible. That's all right. Gosh, it's, it's life. Um, so one last question about your music before I yeah. uh, get into the very juicy topic of acting. Um, what do you think you get out of music that you don't get from acting? Complete creative control. Yeah. And not in a sense of like control, but in a sense of like, oh, I get to choose this synth and I get to choose like the, all the specific nuances. It's just like completely just me and like even if it might be wrong or I don't like it or it's, there's a vocal thing that doesn't work it's like I still get yeah it's just it's just me and it's not a character you know mm. what I mean like it's maybe a heightened version of me or a deeper version but it's not um a, it's there's no pretense so yeah. Yeah. yeah well I mean let's talk about uh some of your acting because uh, let's face it, it's a, a huge uh, role that you secured uh, not too long ago before the world came crashing down uh, with American Princess, which is, you know, funny, lighthearted uh, and yeah, like a, a big, a big main role in, in the States. It looked like it was just really, really fun. Uh, would I be right in saying that? Yeah, it was the, probably the best experience of my life professionally. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that was a good call yeah. then. What made it so good? What made it so fun? The work ethic of the um, crew and cast, I think. Everyone was like so purely present and prepared and wanted to be there and organised and open and passionate to be like, oh, what about this idea for this thing? Let's go practice it. Okay. Like, let's do this. Like, it was just yes and, yes and, yes and everywhere. And mm. the... I would be, I could not have done that show without the support of those incredible actors and directors and Jamie Demo, the showrunner, um, mm. completely not padded me, but like ha inspired me to, I felt like I was stepping up to their preparation and their incredible talents. Um, mm. And I, and I think that they, everyone had something very unique to offer and it was just a great mix of people was the people it was just a very joyous joyous set and being a comedy too we were mm. just allowed to lean into that all the time yeah uh, you did mention uh jamie uh dembo uh who is the showrunner uh and obviously uh, for people who might not have seen 
American Princess. It is a, a very bizarre story about a, a girl who goes through a breakdown and then starts working at a Renaissance fair. And hilariously, this is, this is what actually, well, not to that extent, but this is what happened to Jamie, wasn't it? The showrunner. Yeah, yeah. So it was sort of se semi-autobiographical because yeah. she, she went to a Renaissance fair and, and re it, it changed her life. She, I don't think she, and she spent a season there, a couple of seasons, but she didn't yeah. like move there. Didn't have a breakdown. Uh, no, 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 she didn't have that, that inciting incident that they invented. But, she, but she, yeah, she was, and so the insight that she had into Ren Fairs was like, something would be, I would have to say something on set. And then like, I'd run up to her and like clarify. It was like, was this the actual word that was used? And she'd be like, oh yeah, and this is how you would do it. You know, kind of, it was like having a history mm you know, professional there about it. And we did have history, you know, historical professionals often there with, with the right things to say and the right things to do. And off and the background, which in Australia we call extras, um, they call them background. I don't think, yeah, I think that's, yeah, we call them background because they're reoccurring. They're not just like, oh, an extra comes and then an extra leaves. You have the same set of people. And a lot of those um, people were Ren, Rennie, Rennies, people who go to Ren fairs. And so I became sort of like chummy with them and would ask them those kinds of questions. So yeah, it was very, I think also the, the key to that show being so fun to make is a Ren fair is a fun, joyous place to be. And mm. they recreated the set exactly like walking into a fair. So it was like going to a fair every day in 110 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> So after that experience, do you think you're more or less likely to go to a Renaissance fair in the future? Oh, I've been to one. They're amazing. Yeah. yeah. Do you think will you, go, will you go to more though now? Yeah. I mean, if, some, if one was on, I would definitely go. It's like, it's mm. super, it's super enchanting and it's, it's cosplay and it's, it, you know, taps into my witchiness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. I want to bring things back home to Australia for a little bit because uh, one of the roles that I, I saw you do uh, prior to that was uh, with Anzac Girls, where you played Australia's most decorated woman, I believe, um, historically speaking. So Alice Ross King, who was a very famous uh, Australian nurse. What was it like taking on a role? which had so much, I guess, emotional significance, historical significance, and something that, you know, you, I guess you had a lot of pressure to do, to do properly. I mean, what was working on a role like that like? Yeah, yeah, a lot of pressure. <laughs> I think having, so we, each of us five ladies who played these real nurses back in World War I, were given the, the diaries that these actual women had written at the time of the war. So they're actual accounts. And that's how they wrote, um, that's how Peter uh, Reeves wrote Anzac Girls was from these records. And they're in the, um, the you know, the museum in Corla, Queensland or Brisbane, where they keep all the war um, documents. And so I had Alice's diary with me and that was basically just a, com a complete portal into her inner life that I could access for any scene that was going to happen because they wrote the scenes from these encounters, these real encounters from the diary. So like I would go on set and do the scene where, you know, you only would say a few lines and things are going on, but the subtext was written about how she was feeling in the diary. So it was, such a blessing. I don't think I could have done that show without her diary to the, to, um, to the extent of like honoring for me to feel satisfied in honoring her emotional life. Mm. Um, but again, you know, it, it, the cast and crew, like the cast was so passionate about it. We all knew that we had this immense responsibility to tell the truth and to do these people justice and not just the characters, but the families that are all still alive, like the grandchildren of Alice Ross King, you know, I was thinking about being aware of them. And, and, you know, the extras would come on set, especially the dudes, this man who played the soldiers, and they'd be all just like extras as extras are just hanging out and being chill and the actors too. And then they would put the military costume on extras and the actors, and they would be like, you know, it mm. would be the thing that would make you stand up and be like, oh, you know, and, and that it, I think Anzac Girls was a huge lesson in, in costume, how important costume is. And when you yeah. step into your costume, like I had, I think my corset is here somewhere. I kept it. 
Oh my no gosh, fun. Corset. <laughs> I know, right? It, it was like, it's a 1915 corset. So those are the ones that are underneath your breast and they go all the way down past, past your hip. So it's, it's a, they're the most oppressive as opposed to the um, earlier ones in, in um, uh, American Princess where they're shorter, they're, mm. they're shorter and higher. Um, so it makes you completely stand up. So I developed this new posture and then I had all these layers of the nurse clothes and that was the key. That was, yeah, her diary and having that kind of costume was a uh, key into that, into that world. Wow. What a personal history lesson that would have been for you. Uh, and mm -hmm. also a rather exciting movie to work on uh, as well. I mean, uh, a show because uh, there was moments where there was explosions, there was gunfire and, Oh but, yeah. <laughs> it looked like you were right smack bang in the action there for that, uh, those stunts. Was, is that the case? Yeah. yeah. So they had me on a harness for that. I don't know if you're referring to that one, that amazing shot is, is there's bombs going off and then I'm being, there's a bomb happens here and I'm sort of lynched that uh, pulled this way. That's the one. You got, that, you got blown away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So oh, I had, a, I got a heart. I'm pretty sure I was wearing a harness, and they just yanked me, and there was a pad there. That was probably my most favorite time of Anzac Girls was doing that sequence. We finished at like two a.m. or something, but wow. you know, getting muddy and just running around screaming and mm. <laughs> just with bombs going off, and and the guy, God, I can't remember his name, but he was from the department that not just the props department but the special effects department that they make these little um these little bomb things and they tell you where they're going to be and like if you run there, that way and make a mistake you'll get hit by the fire and yeah that doesn't sound really very fun at all that sounds terrifying no, but it's <laughs> well, like exciting. <laughs> they were um, doing these really cool things that like, there was like a puddle and i i like had to i fell the camera was there and i fell next to the puddle and they would throw tiny little um rocks next to the puddle that made it look like the shrapnel was falling around me and they were just like don't move because we're going to like throw shit around you wow yeah. and yet, were you like this is the money maker baby yeah. <laughs> don't, you, don't you throw anything near this um well i do have to let you you go uh so i, I did want to ask one last question and that is i mean for you this would have been such an exciting time seeing how successful american princess was you know really ticking off those big big kind of achievements and I guess you were set to take over, uh, you know, the LA acting scene, then things went awry. So can you tell us, where do you think that you'll be heading next? Where should we keep our eyes uh, on you for? What's the next big role? So the thing about American Princess was we had to wait basically a year to know if it was going to go again. And in that period, I wasn't really auditioning for anything because when you're in a contract, they don't really want to consider you if mm. you know what I mean so I was in a holding pattern for quite a long time and then the show didn't go ahead which you know happens all the time in the states and then I was able to audition again so this year was my first pilot season since the show that I was able to kind of audition for and I had a really 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 good experience um and I did pretty well but then you know COVID happened and everything sort of had a pause button on it so um but f from my understanding I don't think there's any going back to Hollywood anytime soon because of COVID. And I think what's going to happen is projects will be filmed in Australia, in New Zealand, in Ireland, in places where we, there's less restrictions and those big companies will want to employ um, Australians and New Zealanders and people that are actually here. So maybe people, maybe this is going to be an opportunity for people who otherwise wouldn't have a sh uh, go on those shows might actually have a, a shot. I mean, I don't know. This is just all speculation because, you know, things mm. change all the time. But I know that there is quite a few projects happening here in Australia at the end of the year and I'm, I'm auditioning. I do have an audition for one tomorrow. And, yeah, I, I'm, I think I just... Of all this, like, six months of reflecting of, like, being in LA and then coming back here, I've realised, like, I just want to do really good work with really amazing people and talented directors. It doesn't really matter where it is. And if it's in Australia, I mean, I love Australia and I love working with Australians. So if, if, the great, if, the, if the story I care about is here, I'll be here. And if it's in LA, I'll be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow, that is such a lovely and positive way to wrap up this interview. So um, <laughs> I'm definitely going to leave it at that. Looking forward to getting a chance to listen to your witchy new music. 
And, and of course, if anyone else wants to jump aboard, you are available on Spotify. We can do some covers on YouTube. So uh, everyone check that out. Uh, Georgia Flood, thank you so much for joining us on Build in Isolation. No worries. Bye.